This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. All right. It sounds like it. Okay. We got the power of the Spirit, but we needed some power with the PA system too. All right. Would you take your Bibles and turn tonight to Daniel chapter number 11. Now, last uh, Sunday that we had our Bible study was two weeks ago. (coughs) And in that Bible study, we were in the first half of Daniel chapter 11. And I told you before we began that uh, it was the most detailed historical prophecy of all the prophecies that are given in the Old Testament. And sure enough, we saw as we were going through it, verse by verse by verse, all the way through chapter, uh, through verse 19 of the chapter, uh, about this ongoing battle between these two kingdoms that we see throughout the chapter. Now, if you look up here at the board, I'm going to just kind of remind us of several things. First of all, let's get our bearings of the map. This is the map you've seen the preacher draw a hundred times. If you've seen it, draw me, seen me draw it once. Uh, hopefully it's somewhat easy to figure out. Uh, Braden, what's this river down here? The Nile River, that's right. Sorry, Braden, I thought you got it last time. All right, there's the Nile River. So this is North Africa. Up above that is the modern day country of Turkey, which in the Bible is referred to as what? What is Turkey called in the Bible? Asia or Asia Minor. That's right, Miss Kim. This little island just below Turkey, we've been talking about it in the book of Acts because uh, one of the famous missionaries was from the island of Cyprus. What's, I just told you the name, didn't I? Uh, Yep, ruined that one. All right, there's the island of Cyprus. Uh, So for a bonus then, who was the famous missionary from the book of Acts that was from the island of Cyprus? Anybody know? T.R.? Paul. It wasn't Paul, but he was a close friend of Paul. Barnabas, Barnabas that's right. Very good, Miss Kim. All right, I won't put Barnabas' name up there. Then over here, we have two bodies of water and a river flowing between them. Uh, this is the promised land right here where I'm circling. What is this body of water uh, to the north? east corner of the promised land. Uh, You're close, Uncle Milton. That's this one down here in the southeast corner. Abigail, what's this one up here? You're right, Sea of Galilee. So we've got two, the Dead Sea, which is also called the Salt Sea, and uh, uh, Timothy, church has started. Church has started. The river that flows between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Who knows that one? Jordan. The Jordan River. That's right. I about all of this last year. I don't remember any of it. Well, here's your review. There's the Jordan River. And then over here we have the Persian Gulf. Oh, I, I know what that one is. The Persian Gulf. We still uh, hear it, see it in the news today. Uh, there are two rivers that flow from... Uh, to the north of the Persian Gulf. Tigris and Euphrates. That's great. The Tigris and the Euphrates. Do you know which is which? Um, that one is that one is the Euphrates. No, it's Tigris. No, it's Tigris. Yeah, and the other one is Euphrates. All right, the Tigris and the Euphrates. By the way, this area that is in the middle of the two rivers is a famous piece of land. You'll remember from world history, it's called Mesopotamia. Uh, Any of you young folks remember what the word Mesopotamia means? Hadn't learned that one yet in school. You will. Anybody. Mesopotamia means land between the rivers. And, And it is some of the most fertile land in the entire world. This was some of the first land that was settled 
right after Noah and his sons and their families came off the ark and the earth began to be populated again after the flood. So this is an overview of the map we're looking at. You'll remember that the Persian Empire, which comprised all of this area and area to the east as well, we saw that in the beginning of um, Daniel chapter 11, we had the prophecy that another empire, another kingdom was going to take over the Persian Empire. It would be a kingdom from the west that would come in and take it over. You're close. It's before the Romans. The Romans will come a little bit later. What's the empire that was important in history between the Persians and the Romans? The Greeks. You got it. And uh, Uncle Milton, who was the, the leader of the Greeks as they came through? Alexander the Great. So all of this was conquered by the Greeks after it was the Persian Empire. But you remember the prophecies we've seen in several places in the book of Daniel is that the king of the Greeks, who conquered everything with great speed, who we know was Alexander the Great, he died without leaving the kingdom to one of his heirs. He had two young, uh, young sons that were both murdered right after his death, even though they were children. And his kingdom was broken up into how many separate kingdoms? Tr, Four. Four of his generals divided Alexander the Great's empire. You had Greece and Macedonia over here. You had uh, Asia Minor up here. Then you had a kingdom here in Syria and a kingdom down here in Egypt. The kingdom... Over here, uh, well, down here in Egypt was taken over or ruled by one of Alexander the Great's generals. And uh, does anybody remember what family name ruled Egypt? T.R.? The Ptolemy family. And then there was, uh, they basically ruled all of Egypt and the promised land. All right. Then we had another one of Alexander the Great's generals that ruled Syria. So it would have taken in much of this area here. And so the two were kind of bumping right up against one another. The area here was Syria. What was the family that ruled this? The Seleucids. The Seleucid. So this was known as the Seleucid Empire. This is the Ptolemaic or Egyptian Empire. But keep in mind that the Ptolemy family were not Egyptians. They were one of Alexander the Great's generals and his family, his descendants. So they were Greeks like Alexander the Great. The Seleucid family, who ruled the Seleucid Empire, by the same token, they weren't Syrians. They were descendants of one of Alexander the Great's generals, so they were Greeks also. So you have the Greeks ruling Egypt, even though they're not Egyptians, and the Greeks of another general ruling Syria, even though they're not Syrians. In the book of Daniel, chapter number 11 now, the Seleucid Empire is referred to as the North and their leader is referred to as the King of the North. The Egyptian Empire in Daniel chapter 11 is referred to as the Southern Kingdom and their different rulers are called the Kings of the South all throughout this chapter. And so all the way up through verse number 19, we've seen one ruler after another who will come from the north and make war on the south. Or from the south and make war on the north. And of course, every time they do that, 
the poor folks that get caught in the middle are the people who live here in the land of Israel and the, the province of Palestine. This star right here would be approximately where Jerusalem would be located. So if they wanted to invade the south, why, they have to come right through Israel to do it. If they want to invade the north, why, they have to go right up through Israel to do it. So Israel was caught in the middle, and they got the worst of all of it. Abigail? That's right. When they came through with their armies, their armies took whatever they needed and kept right on going. That's right. That's right. And Israel was just stuck in the middle. And of course, there, militarily, there really wasn't anything they could do about it because their armies were so small in comparison, they really had no say in what was going on. So let the preacher get his Bible open here and I'll catch up with you. We got all the way down through verse 19 in our last study. And um, the verses leading up to and including verse 19 dealt with one of the kings of the north that's very famous in history. His name was Antiochus the Great. We saw how he invaded the south on a couple of occasions. He also uh, invaded all the islands along Asia Minor and even over near Greece. But he finally encountered an army that was moving from the west, moving eastward, a new empire that was on the rise, that we're going to see much in world history about this empire, the Roman Empire that Abigail already mentioned. The Romans, when uh, Antiochus the Great ran into them, it was like running into a wall. And the Romans were not going to budge. The Romans decisively defeated Antiochus the Great in several battles, especially the Battle of Magnesia in which his entire army was wiped out and he barely escaped with his life. He was finally forced to sign a treaty with the Romans in which he agreed that he would give up all those islands that he had previously conquered and he would pay to Rome every year a thousand talents of silver. That would be along the lines of this amount of money. One talent would be worth about two million dollars dollars today. So if he's paying a thousand talents of silver every year, that's two billion dollars in today's money worth of silver he had to pay every year to Rome to pay them back for all the destruction he did when he started the war with them. He also had to do something else. The Romans had already let him off the hook one time when he was starting wars down here in Egypt, one of their allies. So this time when Rome beat him so bad and forced him to sign a treaty, not only was he forced to give back all the islands, pay $2 billion worth of tribute every year, he was also forced to send 12 of his closest friends and family members back to Rome to be hostages to make sure he never broke the treaty. Of course, if he broke the treaty, you know what they would have done with the hostages. Yeah, off with their heads. T.R.? So far as to actually befriend and guard Israel against the... Uh, because Antiochus was an evil, wicked man that kill as many of the Israelites as he could whenever he just got angry. And he would just kill them and massacre them out of spite whenever he was. Okay, T.R., let's hold that thought. What you've said is true. Part of it we haven't gotten to yet tonight, though. But T.R. is right that the Ptolemies down here in Egypt, they and the Jews that lived here in the land of Judea, they were allies. 
because the Ptolemies had assumed the part of Alexander the Great's empire that included not only Egypt, but also the Promised Land. And so every time the Seleucids would invade, the Ptolemies, as T.R. correctly said, would bring their armies up to guard Judea and Palestine, as well as guarding Egypt. You can also think of it another way, too. They weren't just doing that to protect their province that they controlled in Judea because they liked them, though there was some friendship there. They were also doing it because they'd much rather fight the Seleucids up here in somebody else's backyard than to fight the Seleucids down here in Egypt and have all their stuff get messed up. So, Israel is kind of a buffer land. But T.R.'s right, the Ptolemies protected Israel because it was part of their empire. All right, that brings us down to verse number 20. One last thing I'll say, though, about those 12 hostages that Antiochus the Great was forced to give to Rome. One of them was one of his sons. He is the son we've already seen in other prophecies in Daniel. We're going to see him again. Antiochus the Fourth. Antiochus the Great was Antiochus the Third. His son Antiochus the Fourth, that will later be known as Antiochus Epiphanes. We've seen him already. By the way, Antiochus Epiphanes is being held hostage in Rome. He was not the eldest son of Antiochus the Great, though. So Antiochus Epiphanes was not actually in line to be the next ruler of the Seleucid Empire. His brother was. And his brother continued to live here in Syria. We're about to see him. Look at verse number 20 in the chapter as we begin our verse-by-verse study tonight. Then shall stand up in his estate, that is the kingdom of the north, a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Verse number 20 is about the son of Antiochus the Great who became the king when his daddy died. Antiochus the Great died in battle out in the east fighting in war. He was finished fighting with the Romans this direction, so he said, you know what? I think I'll go that direction and fight a little while with somebody else. He was killed in battle. His son became the next ruler of the Seleucid Empire. The verse here, verse 20, is the only verse in the Bible about this son, the eldest son of Antiochus the Great, but it's a very accurate verse about his entire rule. It says he only ruled for a few days. He ruled in total between 11 and 12 years. You say, well, 11 and 12 years, that's quite a long time to rule. No, not really. His daddy, Antiochus the Great, had ruled as king for 37 years. So compared to his daddy and some of the other kings, 11 years wasn't really that long. It also says about him, though, his legacy that's left for all history to remember, not that he was a great general, not that he was a kind king, but that he was a raiser of taxes. That's what he's remembered for. Now, there's a reason that his son who becomes king is known as a raiser of taxes. Because when his daddy died... His son who became the king was left with that huge debt that had to be paid to Rome every single year to keep the treaty up. And if he didn't pay the money that he owed the Romans, guess who was going to come knocking on the door to break some kneecaps? The Romans would have come and taken whatever they weren't paid. So he raised taxes. This is a historical fact. He's known in Seleucid history as the king that raised taxes the most on the people throughout his empire. 
he still didn't have the money to pay the debt every year. And so he sent his agents down to the temple in Jerusalem to raid the Jewish temple. And they literally not only went through the Jewish temple and took silver vessels that had been made for use in the temple there, but he had his men go through the underground vaults under the temple mount in Jerusalem looking for anything of value, silver or gold, that he could find to send back to Rome. So his only claim to fame is he was a raiser of taxes. The last thing it says about him in verse 20, though, it says that um, he would die, but not from anger and not from battle. Not uh, before he even got started good, after ruling about 11 or 12 years, there were a number of people that were unhappy with his raising of taxes. And one of the men who worked in his court as an official secretly was behind a plot and they poisoned the son of Antiochus the Great. He died of poisoning. Well, just before he had died of poisoning, he had sent his oldest son, uh, the grandson of Antiochus the Great, he had, the new king had sent his oldest son to Rome to offer himself for a few years as a stand-in for Antiochus Epiphanes, the king's brother, so that the king's brother could come back home. After all, he's been a hostage now for a dozen years. So he sends his own son to take his place. The Romans treated him well. So his brother, Antiochus Epiphanes, is on his way back from Rome to home when the king gets poisoned. When Antiochus Epiphanes gets to Asia Minor, Word comes to him that your brother the king has been poisoned. And another man has taken over the kingdom. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes stopped in at a place called Pergamos, which is a, an important city-state in Asia Minor. They were good friends with the Romans. And he, he met with the king of Pergamos, and he said, Listen, I'm headed home but somebody back home has killed my brother, the king. Now, the Seleucid Empire was a very uh, wealthy empire and a very uh, mighty empire militarily. So he signed a deal with the king of Pergamos that the king of Pergamos would send some men with him to go take back the throne of the Seleucid Empire that had been stolen from his brother who was poisoned. So the king of Pergamos agreed to it. I'm sure expecting to get paid for his help. Antiochus Epiphanes gets back to Syria. And through some negotiations with some of the wealthy families, the nobility in the Seleucid Empire there in Syria, he strikes a deal with them also. And without any fighting even having to be done, the other fellow who had poisoned his brother is assassinated himself. And Antiochus Epiphanes becomes the new king of the Seleucid Empire. Now it's interesting to remember that Antiochus Epiphanes is not the next in line to be the king of the Seleucid Empire. His brother's oldest son, who just went to Rome so that Antiochus Epiphanes could come home, he's the one who's the rightful ruler. But instead of Antiochus Epiphanes sending word back to Rome that uh, we'd like for you to let uh, the king's son go because he's needed to become the next king, Antiochus Epiphanes just said, well, you know what, I'm already here, fellas. I'll just be happy to to take the job. If you want me to, I'll, 
I'll take the job for you. And so without being the rightful heir to the throne, he became the next ruler. And that's what we see in verse 21. And in his estate, the king of the north, shall send up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That's exactly how Antiochus Epiphanes became the king. He, didn't, he wasn't supposed to be the rightful ruler, but he talked those who had power and influence into appointing him the new king and making him king instead of sending for the fellow who was supposed to be the king back in Rome. Verse 21 is a very accurate description of him becoming king. However, this verse was written 200 years before Antiochus Epiphanes ever became king. This prophecy was written hundreds of years before it actually occurred. Timothy, you can go. Please come back as soon as possible. In the future, though, do that before you come back over here. Verse number 22. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now, verse number 22, in fact, verse 20, all the way down through verse 35, all these verses are about Antiochus Epiphanes. There's more said about Antiochus Epiphanes in this chapter than any of the other kings we've seen in this chapter that covers about 200 years worth of history. But this particular king, as you know from Daniel chapter 8 and 9, Antiochus Epiphanes is a forerunner or a shadow of the Antichrist who is yet to come in the future. So there's much to say about Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse 21 through 35 are about things that he will actually do in history at the time Daniel writes these words. By the way, he has done, he did do everything as it was prophesied from verses 21 to 35. It says here though in verse 22, With the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Verse 22 is talking about uh, two possible things. It's either talking about a peace treaty or a covenant that he signed with the king of Egypt that he broke, or it could be talking about the high priest of Israel that's in Jerusalem being referred to as the prince of the covenant. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, the people of Israel are referred to as the people of the covenant. That is the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. So it could be the high priest of Israel that's being referred to as the prince of the covenant. Or it could be the prince of Egypt with whom the king of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes, has made a treaty or a covenant. We do know, whichever it is, that Antiochus Epiphanes had the high priest of Israel murdered, killed assassinated. You say, why would he do that? Well, in trying to pay all of that money to Rome that was owed every year, his brother, who had been poisoned, the raiser of taxes, he had kept trying to take more and more and more, not only from the people of Judea, the Jews, but also from the tithes that were paid to the temple in Jerusalem. And the priest there at the temple, the high priest, said, this money is for the house of God, you, you can't have it. Well, he was the king, so he took whatever he wanted. When he was assassinated and poisoned, Antiochus Epiphanes did the same thing. He started taking the tithe money from the temple in Jerusalem also, and he and the high priest of Israel went head to head in an argument. Consequently, because he had an army and the high priest didn't have an army, 
the high priest is the one that lost his head in the argument. And so we do know that he, Antiochus Epiphanes, had the high priest of Israel killed. Perhaps he is the prince of the covenant being referred to, or maybe it's a treaty with Egypt that he broke, because we know that he broke one. Let's continue verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. It seems here that the prince of the covenant is most likely in this particular respect talking about the Ptolemy who was ruling Egypt at the time. Because while Antiochus Epiphanes had just become the new ruler of Syria, there was also a new king who became the ruler of Egypt in the Ptolemy family. He was a young man, but he also had a brother. And he and his brother both claimed they had a right to be the king of Egypt. The new king, though, was the eldest son of the king who just died, So as was the custom, he was recognized as the new king of Egypt. But his brother didn't go along with it. So Antiochus Epiphanes said, you know what? I'm going to come down here and I'm going to recognize you as the official king of Egypt. And I'll join with you in telling your brother to take a hike because you're the real king of Egypt. We've already seen Antiochus Epiphanes being a slick talker. That's how he got to be king in the first place. Now he's telling this young king of Egypt, listen, let me come down there and make sure that your brother doesn't take the kingdom away from you. History tells us that what happened in this verse happened in real life. He came down into the south, with a small army, not a big army like had been done before, but a small army. And when he came down into Egypt, he stopped at first one city, and then another, and then another. Every time he went to a different city, he used his slick-talking ways to make deals with the families in those cities that were running the cities. And the deal went something like this. I know there's an argument going on between the, your king and his brother, but listen, we both know my army's bigger than both of theirs. So why don't we just make a deal? You will agree to give me whatever... I ask for, and I'll give you protection from anybody that comes and tries to tell you what to do. With his army, he began to literally bribe some of the most important cities in Egypt into following him against the real king of Egypt. All the while, he's still telling the king of Egypt, I'm down here to help you and to make sure that your brother doesn't try to take the kingship away from you. Sounds like some politicians in Washington. Slick talking, but lying through his teeth. What's that old joke? How do you know when a politician is lying? When his mouth is moving. Well, that would be a good description of Antiochus Epiphanes. But he was a slick talker. At some point, I'm sure the king of Egypt realized he was being taken for a sucker. Let's continue here, though, in verse number 24. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Verse 24 is telling us how he came to control some of the most important cities in Egypt without even having to fight a battle. He did something that his father 
Antiochus the Great had never been able to do. It's something his grandfathers had never been able to do. Even with all their armies, he took the best parts of Egypt and he never even had to fire a shot, so to speak, to do it. Through bribery. He literally bribed the people who lived in the area and those running the cities. You work for me and I'll make sure you get paid and rewarded handsomely for it. And through flattery and trickery, he did something none of the other Seleucid leaders had ever been able to do. He literally was in control of the fattest, that is the wealthiest parts of all of Egypt without even having to fight a battle. It says there at the end of the verse, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Eventually, the Egyptian king and his brother realized, hey, this outsider is taking advantage of the fact that we're fighting each other. So they joined together and said, let's get this guy out of our land. And they came up with a plan. Verse 26. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. And his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. This is actually talking about the king of the south who comes up to drive the king of the north out of Egypt. The king of the south, it's a historical fact, was actually killed in a conspiracy by those in his own court who had been bribed by Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse 26 is about the king of Egypt being killed by those that he trusted. It says, Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. The people he was taken care of and had, been, and had put him in office, they're the ones that conspired and killed him. Verse 27. And both of these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, the king of the north and the king of the south. And they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Antiochus Epiphanes and the king of the south sat together at the same table to have a meal and to come up with a plan. But they were both lying to each other the whole time. They both had their own secret plan they were trying to make happen and they were lying to each other. Two liars lying to each other. Antiochus Epiphanes was trying to still convince him that he was just there to help him. The king of the south was lying to Antiochus Epiphanes saying, uh, you know, if you'll just help me, then uh, I'll make sure you're paid and you're rewarded. All the meanwhile, he was working with his brother in secret to put together an army to drive Antiochus Epiphanes out of Egypt. Verse 28. Then shall he return into his land with great riches. That's Antiochus Epiphanes. He's taking back all the wealth of those cities in Egypt that he's bribed. And his heart shall be against the holy covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So all these cities that were in on the plan with Antiochus Epiphanes went along with his bribes they gave him much wealth to take back home. On his way back home, he has to pass through the same place Abigail mentioned at the beginning, the land of Israel. And as he goes through Judea, he decides, well, you know what? I might as well stop here. Uh, after all, this is where that high priest I had problems with and my brother had problems with. This is where he was causing problems. I'll just stop here and see what else there is to loot on the way back home. Verse 28 is talking about the fact that he did exploits. He took things from the land of Israel on his way back home. Verse 29. 
At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south. Don't be surprised. This is what the two kingdoms have been doing for 200 years. Going up, coming back. Going up, coming back. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Ah, there's about to be a turn of events. The first two times that Antiochus Epiphanes came down here, he had success taking the wealth of Egypt back home with him. All of his fortune against Egypt is about to change. Verse 29 tells us his next trip to Egypt isn't going to be as well as the first or the second trip were. Verse 30. Here's why it doesn't work out so well. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return. I want to stop here and show you on the map what we're talking about. The island of Cyprus here was property of the Ptolemies. Even though it's way up here, it was controlled by Egypt and was a very wealthy island colony. Well, this colony in Cyprus was known for their ships and they traded all over the Mediterranean Sea with different civilizations. Because they had such a mighty fleet, when Antiochus Epiphanes puts together his own navy and goes over to attack Cyprus before his plan to come down and attack Egypt, he, his fleet gets near Cyprus and lo and behold, there's a major naval battle. The fleet of Antiochus Epiphanes is almost totally wiped out and sunk to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. With no fleet, there's no way to transport his troops and transport supplies for the army. So now he's forced to go back home empty-handed. Didn't work out as well as it did the first two times he went to Egypt. You reckon he was very happy that he was going home empty-handed this time? No. You reckon he was very happy that his great fleet of ships was now sunk at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea? No. He wasn't happy at all. He wasn't a happy camper, Braden. And so he turns his attention in a direction against a group of people that he already doesn't like and a group of people that he know can't fight back. Let's see who. Verse 30, middle of the verse. For the the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation, that is anger, against the Holy Covenant. Now who are the people of the Holy Covenant? They're Israel, the Jews, the covenant with God. He's angry. He's he's looking for somebody to take his anger out on. He already doesn't like the Jews and they can't fight back. There's somebody that's easy to punch on. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. You wouldn't believe this unless it was right here in the Bible, but we know that historically when he went into Judea, approaching Jerusalem, He was approached by some of the Jews who considered themselves leaders of the Jews, the Jewish community, and they said, listen, um, we don't want any more fighting here. Let's make an arrangement. Some of the Jews betrayed their own people and became spies working for Antiochus Epiphanes against their own people. In fact, T.R., these Jewish spies were helping Antiochus Epiphanes round up other Jews so they could be killed. D. 
during this time and for the next several years, Antiochus Epiphanes wreaks havoc on the land of Israel. Thousands of Jews will be killed. We've seen some of that in previous prophecies of Daniel. Look at verse 31. And arms shall stand on his part. That is, he'll use force of arms. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. The sanctuary, of course, is the temple of God. It's called the sanctuary of strength because the Jews, in order to try to protect the temple in Jerusalem, had literally built fortifications around the temple mount to try to protect it and fend off the army of Antiochus Epiphanes. But to no avail. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. You know what Antiochus Epiphanes did in the temple in Jerusalem. We saw this earlier in the book of Daniel when we saw another prophecy about Antiochus Epiphanes. What did Antiochus Epiphanes do to pollute the temple in Jerusalem? Timothy? That's exactly right. The altar where animal sacrifices were made to Jehovah God, he polluted it and the whole temple by offering the sacrifice of a sow, a pig, on the altar of God. By the way, I did a little more reading this past week. He had his men take the, uh, the sow that was sacrificed on the altar, and they made a broth from cooking the pig that was offered as a sacrifice, and they took that broth and went all throughout the temple of God, pouring the broth of this pig sacrifice all over the temple. Polluted the whole temple and, of course, the altar. And there where the altar of God was, after it was polluted, he erected an altar to the God that he worshipped, Zeus, the king of the Greek gods. And there defiled the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem. Verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Those Jews that were working with him, that had betrayed their own people, he corrupted them by flattery. That is, he promised them bribes if they would work for him against their own people. Now folks, there's not anything any more despicable than someone that will betray their own people. For money. But that's what some of the Jews did. But look at the rest of verse 32. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. There were a group of Jews who refused to accept Antiochus Epiphanes being in their land and defiling the temple of God. And these Jewish patriots are known in history as the Maccabees. They're known as the Maccabees after one of their leaders, Judas Maccabee, who led them. These were kind of guerrilla fighters. They didn't have a large enough army to fight Antiochus Epiphanes right out in the open. So they used guerrilla warfare tactics. Hit and run. Hit and run. Whenever they could, they'd strike and then go back into hiding in the populace. The Maccabees were very successful at this hit and run style of warfare and caused Antiochus Epiphanes great problems. But then he started sending his soldiers out to hunt down those who fought with the Maccabees. Look at verse 33. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. That is, the people that are patriotic Jews. The Maccabees and those that follow them. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame 
by captivity, and by spoil many days. The Maccabees, most of those who fought against Antiochus Epiphanes early on, were captured and killed for standing up for their people and for God. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. What it's telling us here is that as the Maccabees were hunted down and killed, more Jews came and took their place. At first, just a few Jews took their place who were patriotic Jews. But then as some of the other Jews began to realize, hey, maybe there's something to gain from this. More and more of the Jews joined in, but not necessarily for patriotic reasons, but because they were looking for financial gain. Nevertheless, whatever their reason was, there were finally enough Jews to run the Seleucids out of Israel. That's verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, that is the the end of the Seleucids being in their land, because it is yet for a time appointed. Folks, this brings us, verse 35, to the end of talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of the north. There are still quite a few verses left in the chapter that we'll look at next week together. The remaining verses in the chapter are still about A king to come. But it's the Antichrist. You'll enjoy these verses that are left for the remaining part of chapter 11 when we meet next week. Questions or comments before we finish?